It's amazing to me how we're not told what the span of time between last week's reading, where Peter makes this bold confession of who Jesus is, to this week's reading, where Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him, where Peter last week got the nickname The Rock because of how bold his confession was, and and this week Jesus calls him Satan. We don't know how far that span of time is, but what I think is amazing is that even Peter, one of the called, one who walked directly with Jesus during his, his earthly ministry, even Peter can get it completely right sometimes. <laughs> and then even Peter can get it completely wrong sometimes. And uh, I find comfort in that because it allows me to not beat myself up when I screw it up. Peter confessed that, that Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one, the, the, the one that would come and fulfill the promises of God and the one in whom Israel could put all, all of her hopes. But Peter and all the people at the time weren't really certain of what that meant, what that meant fully. And a lot of times, we too can get confused on what kind of Savior we have, what kind of God we want. Um, One of my pet peeve phrases is, God is good. And I believe that God is good. But a lot of times, people will say, I got that job. God is good. Or the cancer's in remission. God is good. Or we beat Appalachian State. God is good. And it's true, God is good during all those times. But when I lose my job, God is still good. When the cancer comes back with a vengeance, God is still good. And yes, a couple years ago when Appalachian State beats the snot out of University of Michigan, God is still good because of what he has done for us and through us in Christ Jesus. See, if if, if we just want a Savior who will come in and win all our battles and make everything in our life great, then we don't need Jesus. We see people all over the world who are successful in the things that they do apart from God. But we need a Jesus who is going to make a difference who is going to change the outcome, even if the world would say the way that he goes about doing it doesn't seem right. So as we look in the text this morning, uh, if you pull out your worship folder or, uh, or your Bible, it begins, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. This is a major turning point in Matthew's gospel. Because up until this point, in chapter 4, verse 17, it's, this was after Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, and there's a connection there as well. When Jesus came out of the wilderness after being tempted by Satan, it said from that time on, he went proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. So in chapter 4, that was a turning point in Matthew's gospel. And here, after Peter makes this bold confession of who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we get another major turning point. From that point on, the focus of Jesus' ministry has changed. Now that the disciples have have declared that he is the Christ, Jesus is telling them what that means. This is what it means for me to be the Christ. And so he tells them that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and then he must be killed. And that's all they're hearing. You're going to suffer? You're going to be killed? Wait, we, we're, we're just getting going. We just figured out that you're the Messiah. You're the one. You're the anointed one. And you're telling us that, that, that it's necessary for these things to happen? And they get caught up in hearing all these things, these things that they can't believe, that they miss the last thing that Jesus says. And on the third day, be raised to life. 
And then we see our bold Peter. Peter takes Jesus aside, pulls him away from the rest of the group and says, and begins to rebuke him. Imagine what that must look like. To rebuke his teacher and the man that he just confessed is, is, is the Messiah. He rebukes him and says, Never, Lord. Some translations say, Heaven forbid. God have mercy on you. This will never happen to you. Peter couldn't conceptualize what it meant to have a Savior who had to be beaten and who had to die. Many of the Jews at the time believed in a resurrection of the dead on the last day. But this notion of one who would be raised to life after three days and to be raised to life to never have death touch him again? So even if they heard Jesus say that he was going to be raised after three days in the grave, they could not grasp what it meant. And so Peter says, no, this is not the way that it's supposed to happen. Peter had an idea of who his Savior was supposed to be. And he had the audacity to tell Jesus what that was supposed to look like. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think that we can sometimes do that. We can, we, we can say, God, I want you to take away this tribulation. God, I want, I want you to, to work in this, in this situation and, and, and take the pain away. And sometimes God does work on our behalf and the pain does go away and reconciliation happens and, and sometimes things go well. But we also know from Scripture that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And when God works in our situations, it's for his greater glory, not for our comfort or temporal happiness. So Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. And then what I found interesting as I was reading through this this week is, is look at the number of times there's, there's positional changes, right? Peter pulls him aside. Jesus turns to Peter. Jesus turns to the disciples. So Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Peter, you are the rock, but now you have become a stumbling block in my path. Get behind me because right now you're in front of me and you're out of place. You're trying to tell me things that I am telling you are necessary to happen. And you're trying to say it's not going to happen. Well, guess what, Peter? If it doesn't happen, then none of this matters. And there are some commentaries that say when, when Jesus says, you are a stumbling block to me, it actually has the, the impression that, that Jesus is saying, you are tempting me to not do what my Father has called me to do. Just like Satan in the wilderness said, you've got all the power in the world. You don't have to do this thing that, that, that you feel God is calling you to do. Peter does the exact same thing. God, Jesus, this doesn't have to happen. We can find another way. And Jesus wants to let Peter know that if it doesn't happen this way, then none of it is going to matter. He couldn't hear, Peter couldn't hear what Jesus was saying. And notice what Jesus says. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. That's what caused Peter to say what he said. Remember last week when Peter made the bold confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? How did Peter get that message? It was not from flesh and blood, but from the Father in heaven. Last week, Peter was listening to God. This week, he's listening to his own flesh. I don't want to see you suffer, my teacher and my friend. I don't want to see you die. I don't know what this means when you say that you're going to raise again, but I don't want this to happen. I don't want to see you hurt. I think a lot of us could take that same position. But Peter was thinking with his flesh and not with revelation of God the same revelation that God gave him in the previous episode. And the thing is, Peter, and even us, had a hard time fathoming that death for Jesus 
was not going to be the end. But Jesus said that there was more. So then Jesus turns to his disciples. Again he turns. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. One of the other prescribed readings for this morning is from uh, Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah gets done crying out to God, and then God says back to Jeremiah, if you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will become my spokesman. And then notice these words. Let the people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. In a way, God is telling Jeremiah that he is to be an example for the people of Israel. And so I I find it interesting that, that in all of the turning that happens in the Matthew reading, the other prescribed reading for this morning also has this turning, that we are to be an example for the world to turn to us as they see us take up our cross and follow Jesus. And, and these, these words of, of denying self and taking up a cross, of, of gaining the world but losing our life and, and, and losing, uh, gain, keeping our life and then gaining the world, these should have familiar refrains from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, this whole upside-down world of, of uh, the hungry will be fed, the, the poor will be rich, the brokenhearted will be, will be built up, the first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus isn't changing his tune. But remember that, that in, this, in this moment, Jesus is talking probably to his 12, to the 12 that he has already called to follow him at the beginning of his ministry. And then he says to them, if anyone would come after me. It's almost like he's, he's reinitiating the call to them. Okay, now that you know what this is going to mean, now that you know that, that I am the Christ and that I have to go and die and rise again, this is what it's going to mean to follow you. So are you in? Will you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me? For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Those questions, they're pretty much rhetorical. There is absolutely nothing that we can do to win back our soul. There's nothing that we can do to win the world, because if we do that, we lose, we lose our soul. So what kind of exchange is that? But the beautiful answer to that nothing is nothing that we can do. But it's Jesus, by his death and resurrection, that is able to purchase our souls again. And then we have this, this language of, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. That verse is a stumbling block for me. That sounds to me like, isn't that works righteousness? Well, you were a little good and you were a little bad, and so I'm going to pay you for, for what you did. But again, some of the commentaries that, that I read this week said that this is, this is not a, a, uh, a graded scale of repayment, but it's black or white. Did you give up your cross and follow Jesus? Then your reward is eternal life. Did you give up your soul so you could gain the world and thus reject Jesus? Then there's payment for that as well. And then another stumbling block. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. A lot of times we, we combine those two verses because they're one sentence away from each other and, and it, it sounds like he's saying that when I come on the last day to judge and, and to repay those for what they have done and there's some of you standing who will not die until you see that and we go, Jesus, you're a liar because all your disciples are dead. Or the 12 apostles, rather. 
But there are many who say that this sentence is a separate thought from the previous one. The very next thing that happens in Matthew's Gospel is the transfiguration, where three of them are able to go up on the mountain, Peter included, and to see Jesus revealed in all his glory with Elijah and with Moses. And as we hear, Peter, uh, Jesus gets his kind of his, his exit plan, his, his own exodus, the rest of the plan of his ministry. And so those three did not taste death before they were able to see Jesus in his glory. There's others who say that, that this refers to Pentecost, post-resurrection, but then the birth of the church. Jesus has ascended into heaven but he dwells in the hearts of the church, dwells in the hearts of the believers. And in that dwelling in the hearts of the church, in the hearts of the believers, his kingdom is spreading. And as, as we go about denying ourselves and taking up our cross, and as we become an example that the world can turn to, that God's kingdom is spreading. And those disciples also did not taste death before that happened. If we aren't careful, we can try to hold on to the things of the world. And that puts us at risk of forfeiting our souls. But thanks be to God that Jesus won back our souls for us on our behalf. And even though we may stumble in our walk, he welcomes us back and he offers us forgiveness to the repentant heart. But to this talk of denying self, and, and, and taking up our cross. Are we to look for tribulation? Are we to look for troubles? What does that look like? When we deny ourselves, are we supposed to just be a, a, a welcome mat for people just to tread on? In Romans chapter 12, Paul gives, I think, a beautiful picture of what it means to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. Paul says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think that is a beautiful picture of what it means to deny ourselves to take up our cross and follow Jesus, to live in harmony with the brothers and sisters in the church, that when, there, when we have struggles and, 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 and when we have differences and disagreements, that we work them out in a godly way so that we can be an example to those on the outside looking in of saying, why are you different? Because when we hear about the early church in Acts, 
they were respected by the people around them that were outside of the church. The church was known for how they loved one another. And it's my prayer that that's how we'll be known, by how we love one another, how we take care of one another, and how we love the world that God so loved. We'll mess it up. There'll be times when we don't offer peace. There'll be times when we offer wrath instead of a cup of cold water. But again, thanks be to God that we get the, not the Savior that we want, but the Savior that we need. Thanks be to God that, that from this moment, Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem, that he didn't succumb to the temptation put forth by Satan himself or by Satan through Peter, but that he went and took up his cross to take on the task before him, and that task to win back your souls from the power of sin, death, and the devil. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we too can take up our crosses, denying ourselves and living for Christ. And when we do that, the kingdom is moving in us. It is spreading through us. And thankfully, we have the benefit of this side of the story that Peter and the, 12, and, and, and the apostles didn't have. We know that for Jesus, death was not the end. And because of that, it's not the end for us either. For his glory and for our good. Amen. Amen.